Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Donna Magnuson, Executive Director of the International Rescue Committee in Phoenix. The International Rescue Committee is the largest of four private resettlement services in Phoenix and supports recently arrived refugees placed in Arizona by the state's Office of Refugee Resettlement. Donna Magnuson became director after leading the Refugee and Immigration Center for Lutheran Social Services of South Dakota for 12 years, and she has generously agreed to share some of her experiences with us. I'd like to thank you, Donna, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So refugee resettlement is not something that one thinks of when one first thinks of Arizona, Maricopa County, Phoenix, Scottsdale. Tell us about the refugee situation and the resettlement situation in Arizona. Well, as you'd mentioned, IRC is one of the largest of the four VOLAG sites that are here in Arizona, helping newcomer refugees to the United States get started in their lives. This year, we'll resettle around 500 individuals into Arizona. That's just through IRC alone, into Phoenix. Um, and they really come from a wide variety of countries depending on what circumstances are happening around the world. Right now we're having refugees who come from Burma, from Bhutan, from Iraq, from Iran, a few from Somalia. In order to be allowed entrance as a refugee, you have fled your home country for reasons of persecution. So we may think about it as hotspots, but I think the other thing we need to think about is that refugees often have lived many, many years in a refugee camp situation um, in very horrid circumstances before giving, getting granted permission to come to the United States. So yes, they are those countries that have had war, have had conflict, where people have had to flee for their lives and have hoped to find shelter and safety somewhere else. So these are people who are coming into this country very often from very stressed Absolutely. environments where nourishment might have been an issue, mm -hmm. personal safety might have been an issue, uh, certainly the expression of rights, religious, personal freedoms, uh, other rights, freedoms of expression. Absolutely. Those freedoms that are guaranteed by our Constitution are not afforded. They land at an airport, and what happens to them? Well, you know, uh, a whole lot of things happen to them that we'd like to think are good things. If I was going to be resettled into the United States, I would like to land in somewhere like Phoenix and be resettled by the IRC. We really start through a whole variety of things. And you know, the mission and vision of the US resettlement programs by IRC is really to move from surviving to thriving. And so you think of all the things that might take place within that. Where we start, where we pick them up at the airport, we've already had an apartment that we've set up for them, we've given them the basic needs um, of, of food and, and bedding and towels and all the things that you need to set up something because for many of these folks they're coming with nothing. Um, you know, they may have a little bag of something that they've been able to save to bring with them, but really they have nothing. So it starts there, but it's really so much more than that. It's helping them get established in the United States. It's helping them find um, their way to medical care. Obviously living in protracted refugee situations, medical care has been something that's really been lacking. So we're able to get them started in that regard. Um, getting their children into school, getting them into employment. And employment is, is a huge part of what we do. In fact, refugee resettlement from the federal government standpoint is really based on the theory of early economic self-sufficiency. So we are a self-sufficiency program, but we certainly know that economic self-sufficiency is only one piece of self-reliance. So we really do a lot more than that. Um, there are six core sectors of service within IRC, uh, one of which is resettlement, which are these basic needs items that we talk about in the beginning. It's almost starting the game of mm -hmm. becoming integrated into the society, becoming self-sufficient. Absolutely. So can you continue that story of, of, of how people go through the various stages that, uh, that your program affords? Um, certainly, you know, it really is that beginning point of thinking about starting from nothing and restarting over with everything. Um, when we tell, say that we've set them up an apartment, um, you know, it's not the Ritz, it's meager living, it's right. enough supplies and belongings to get you going, it's learning how to get a job as quickly as possible to understand the financial market that we live in and the more important part of, you know, what kind of job can you get beginning here and knowing that in America you truly can live the American dream, that you don't have to stay here, right. that this is a stepping stone to somewhere else. 
you know, it's working with the families to be able to get their children to school and understand that in America, as parents, we can become very involved in their education and, and really we provide a lot of education within the resettlement program that focuses on all kinds of things that you need to live and survive in America. Cultural norms. Just the Absolutely. fact that parents can be involved in someone's in their child's education is a big, big deal. Yes, absolutely. And um, children learn English very quickly, so it's working with parents to try to keep up with that curve, so to speak, and learning to speak English so that they can t continue to be good advocates. Now, do you have a network of volunteers who are providing these types of counseling support, or is it is it staff heavy? It's staff and volunteer. We couldn't do what we do without the help of volunteers. We have volunteers who help with teaching English. We have volunteers who act as mentors with families. Just that friendly visitor concept that we know from way back when of, you know, boy, how do I read all this mail and what of it is junk mail? Um, I, I know there's been times in my life I wish I would have had someone like that. So volunteers are very, very important to what we do. But the staff themselves are also very important. Many of them are former residents refugee themselves, so have walked the walk and talked the talk and now are helping others. We uh, have one program that's a pre and postnatal program working with moms with new babies and pregnant moms, you know, trying to have them understand the, the plenitude of things that are available in the United States that will help them raise healthy children. One such case was a Burmese woman who came with a little baby that had been um, diagnosed with a rare disease and really had been underserved for the better part of the first year or so of this child's life and was quite developmentally delayed but by having additional support in the beginning this child is now like every other normal two-year-old and that's a wonderful story but then we're going to move on to economic empowerment which is really about employment and uh, if you've looked for a job lately, you certainly know that unless you know how to use the internet, right. um, you may be a little behind the game, so to speak. So we spend a lot of time with pre-employment training, helping people learn how to access online job applications and what does a resume look like. And if you've uh, had the good fortune, as I'm sure you have in, in what you do, to see the CVs, the curriculum vitas that are pages and pages long for some folks, even to teach them, you know, in, in our world, it's a two-page document at right. best. So there's those kinds of things. Um, really helping them get that leg up. When you talk about the economy, of course, we're trying to have people start on an equal playing field. So it's not only about the pre-employment that needs to occur to get a job, but it's also how do you keep a job. So we've also been able to work very closely with some employers um, to do pre-employment training specific to the work site. Um, we've done some work recently with the dairies who have come to us saying, you know, we, we need some good workers. Um, and so we've been able to develop some training modules that has not replaced what the employer does, but really to give them a beginning place that starts in the same place. We work with about 100 employers to help people find jobs, but really um, the piece that we need to keep focusing on is the client. You know, who are the refugees? The refugees come here with a very wide array of skills and abilities. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have technicians, we have farmers, we have housewives. So with our employment programs, we really focus a lot on that in terms of trying to make those right placements. Um, some of the things that really beyond that first job that we've been able to work with people on is what's that long-term goal? What is your goal in the United right. States? So we also have programs that um, we have a lot of folks that have come that have been farmers. Well, if you've watched any of the, the news lately, it's really about food security and food safety. And so we have a program called New Roots. And um, I'm also new to New Roots here in Arizona, and uh, I come from a place where the land looks a little bit different than the deserts of Arizona, so I can relate somewhat to the refugees' view of things. But we have helped them establish farms. We have three right now inner city community gardens that people are farming. Um, we had one situation where it was a parking lot, and we had rotary clubs and churches come and join us in the quest to renovate this land and now there are about 10 farms, farmers who are farming and gaining produce for their own families off that land. But we also have about 10 other farmers who are on a much broader scale 
who are the Gila Cooperative, mm -hmm. who have really taken off and done some special things regarding CSA, Community Supported Agricultural. Um, they have also just uh, put out a cookbook for uh, produce that I hadn't seen before I moved to Arizona, and they are really thriving in that regard. So when we think about surviving to thriving at IRC, we really try to look at that broad range of pieces of the puzzle that what does it mean for a family to start over in a brand new land. So for our folks who are, come from an agricultural background, it's very important to be able to reconnect with the land. And uh, I can tell you the vegetables taste great. So. <laughs> That's a, a big piece of it in terms of that economic empowerment. I know in talking with staff, I always say that the best job we've done is when they no longer need us. And I can tell you that sometimes that happens pretty quickly. And with other families, as with all families anywhere, um, sometimes it takes a little longer. So we really have to take a, a client-centered, strengths-based approach to service that uh, allows clients to come into a large array of services that are coordinated that can take them from that beginning point and empower them to become self-reliant. This isn't about us creating a plan, it's about us working with them to create their own plan. It's the engaged dialogue with, with both your staff right. and, the, and the people being served. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're helping to convert their strengths into self-sufficiency within this context. Absolutely, and the one thing about client-centered service is that it's a model, I mean, it's been around since Carl Rogers in the 50s, so it's certainly not new, but it is relatively new to the world of refugee resettlement. And the one thing about refugee resettlement is this ebb and flow of funding that comes and goes right. um, that we all live with as nonprofits. And what the model does is allow us to adjust and stretch accordingly. Um, where you're not having to reinvent the wheel every time you bring in a new program, that right. you're bringing in a new program based on this service model that you have that are based on the strengths of the people and the needs of the people that we serve. It's fairly clear how people who are coming into the United States to be resettled benefit from the services that the IRC uh, provides. Let's flip that, uh, that on its head, how does the community benefit from having these refugees come to uh, Phoenix? Well, you know, in the 20 years that I've been working with resettlement and I have been able to tell people that I have the greatest job in the world because I get to go all over the world every single day and I never leave my office. So, you know, I think that there's, there's something to be said about the fact that the U.S. is a land of immigrants and uh, we are a diverse nation and I don't think we should ever lose sight of that. You know, one of the things that we look at when we look at refugee resettlement is some of the other programs that we offer um, within our individual developments account, which are savings accounts. We've had people, refugees, who have bought over 350 cars um, through micro lending and the assistance given to people um, when they've started. We've sold over 250 homes in a uh, economy in Phoenix that uh, for myself as a new home owner here in Phoenix I know what how depressed the market is and yet refugees have been able to go out save money buy homes with a very low default rate so in that way they really have started to renovate communities that's incredible it is it is um, and how many cars did you say about 350 cars that were able to help people um, buy cars, learn how to drive them, you know, make sure they're getting all the insurances, but also buy those cars to be able to get back and forth to work. Um, refugees have a very strong saving ethic um, in order to move forward in that regard. Through our microenterprise um, department, we've also helped about 100 businesses get started. We have people that have started corner grocery stores, that have started restaurants, that have started uh, the most recent one I remember was a man who came in whose brother had started a restaurant and his other brother had started a store, but he really knew that he needed to get the produce to market, so he had started his own trucking firm where he needed some assistance to get going on it. 
these are folks who are repaying these loans on a regular basis and who are really rejuvenating an economy that otherwise was uh, slipping a little bit. So I think that there are all kinds of benefits. Um, you know, we always say it would be great to take a little passport around Phoenix and be able to go to all the new restaurants and businesses that have been created through the refugees that have come here. And I think you'd be really surprised by what you'd find. Um, the community gardens have definitely gone to market, so to speak, and a lot of the folks of Phoenix are being able to enjoy the organic vegetables that are be going, growing at a really high rate. We have about 35 people who have just started with our Community Supported Agriculture Program, our CSA, who every week come to the office and pick up fresh vegetables of all kinds that are organically grown. Um, you know, these are people who have come with skills and who are not just here to take from us, but, but to give back and to really become a part of working and living in America. We also work with people who are working toward their citizenship um, and studying for that test. And it's not easy to become a citizen in the United States. And you have to have good moral character and be a law-abiding citizen and be able to speak English and be able to, to write some English and be able to pass the test. And you know the people are doing that at a remarkable rate while they're also um, learning about living in a brand new world. In my years of working with refugees, if you've looked at the families who come, um, I remember one time working with a, a man from the Ukraine who had been an electrical engineer. And he really um, came, it was wonderful. I mean, I went to the airport, I greeted them at the airport, and the family s broke out in song. And the only thing I can compare it to is if you've ever seen The Sound of Music and the Von Tropp singers, these were his four children and they started to sing God Bless America in English. Um, I get goosebumps just thinking about it, but you know, in reality, when I visited with him later and I said, you know, let's try to get you back into your field. And he said, you know, it's no longer about me, it's about my children. And so to watch those four individuals go off to college and graduate and you know, really become productive members. Um, you don't have to look very far in the United States to find folks who were former refugees. The congressman from New Orleans, um, Congressman Chow, is a former refugee from Vietnam. Um, refugees bring a whole lot to the country in addition to what we give to them. It's, it's a good investment in our money. And what's interesting to me is that mm -hmm. it is the, the greatest recession since the Great Depression. Banks are not lending. So these skills that mm -hmm. refugees bring in are refreshing the American value, the Emersonian values of self-reliance and, and hard work and, and modesty yes. that really were part of our founding. Absolutely. Um, I visited recently with a Burmese family that lived um, it was close to down in the Avondale area. It doesn't really matter where in the city it was, but this was a mom and her mother and her husband and their children, and they had been able to purchase a home and had um, been able to, you know, her front yard was full of, of wonderful flowers, and it was a very welcoming environment, and they were so proud to be able to show us this home, and yet, you know, two or three family members had worked hard to be able to save that money to get into that home. They're also a family that we hope at some point through our microenterprise for child care um, that we help her start her own child care business to be able to look after some of the other family children in the neighborhood. So, um, you know, you'd be able to invest with one family, but in the refugee world it generally permeates through many other generations and with other families who have come. So it's really nice to see, and it's not only here in Phoenix. We've seen that in other areas of the United States as well, where um, in South Dakota, since you mentioned that's where I came from, there was a town of 10,000 people who really were dying. You know, there were very few people going to the school, and the school was worried, and um, a turkey plant opened. There are now 2,000 refugees who, on their own accord, moved to that community. Of those 2,000 people, 60 people have bought houses. So it's not just a Phoenix phenomena, but it really is. When you look at the refugee resettlement to the United States, they bring so much with them. Um, you know, they're survivors. In terms of the model that you use to fund mm -hmm. your 
uh, operations. Talk about the funding, uh, but also talk about the, how your programs function. Funding comes from a variety of sources. Of course, uh, refugee resettlement is a federal program by right. nature, so we get funding through the State Department for that first little piece of what we do in terms of getting them started. Um, we get funding through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is through the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, but that's quite but modest. That's, that, that's sort of the, the, the pump priming. Yeah. We're like any other nonprofit in that regard, that we're always looking to diversify our funding. Right. We have funding through the U USDA to help us with our farm programs. We have funding through private foundations in Arizona to help us with pre-employment. Um, we have funding through the Immigration Service to help people get citizenship. Um, it really is a creative way to continue to do good work. I happen to think that the more you can provide underneath one umbrella, the easier it is for people to move forward. So that really creates an environment where, uh, especially in this economy, we're always looking for more opportunities for small grants, for private foundations, for private donors, um, as well as the federal and state backing that we get in order to provide the best services possible for refugees. And part of the impetus for your private donors is, is the exposure that they get to different cultures. You would refer to your own experience of Mm -hmm. of uh, being able to learn from your clients and benefit from from your clients' lives and their sensibilities. Mm -hmm. do, do, do your donors also get involved in that way? I think they're certainly a part of that, but I think that donors are smarter than we give them credit for sometimes, and they also know about the need for diversity in our own marketplace. Um, where when they have someone that they have just hired or that they have helped to get hired in an employment environment, that person is now already understanding an international concept that people that were born here just don't completely get because they haven't had the opportunity to live in other parts of the world. So certainly there is a feel-good component to, to donation and to fundraising that we certainly see. And um, But I think more than that, they've been able to really see that this is funding something that helps build America that's really moving us forward. Well, if you're going to do business in China, it's awfully good to speak Mandarin. And this is a way to continue to build on our strength that comes out of diversity. Absolutely. And I think the other thing with refugee populations is that we have many who come who do speak at least some degree of English. Um, you know, we hear a lot about the numbers of languages that are spoken. But I've also met with folks who speak four or five or six of those languages, um, including English. I had a former staff member who could walk in the front door and speak to our receptionist in Arabic, who could speak to his client in his tribal language, who could speak to me in English, and speak to my interpreter service coordinator in Spanish in the fell swoop of about four minutes. Um, that's a gift. And that really is what helps our markets get better because we are much more diversified. Is this, in certain respects, an antidote to this whole idea of, of only English uh, in, 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 our, um, in our environment? Isn't it also uh, very beneficial for our economic health and for our societal health to embrace these differences that can leaven our society as well? I truly believe so. I mean, I certainly understand um, we are an English-speaking country and we need to learn to speak English. Um, we certainly tell all of our clients the importance of learning, learning English, English because it's certainly going to help them be better at what they do here in the United States. But countries around the world speak English and, and a variety of other languages. I was in a bookstore in Croatia one time. Um, I will tell you, I was in the English section of the bookstore buying a book and I had this nice little lady tap me on the shoulder and speak to me about the book and I had to admit I'm sorry I only speak English and she just went ah no problem where'd you find the book and I would <laughs> realize that she probably spoke three or four different languages and so yeah I do think that there is a component to that in refugee resettlement that we are bringing the world to the United States which will only strengthen us in the market going forward. Refugees received 24 to 36 months of assistance and now it's down to about eight months? It was just post Refugee Act of 1980 where it started at 36 months and slowly tapered down. Mm -hmm. In the 20 years that I've been in resettlement it's been eight months. Um, eight months is a very short time when you think about 
lifespan of time to try to get your life. And it's not life. a huge amount of oh, assistance. It's, it's, it's really, it's, really low. In fact, um, in the state of Arizona, and it varies from state to state, right. it's, it's barely enough to, to survive and certainly not enough to pay the rent. So it is a huge uh, incentive for people to so move forward. the clock forward. is ticking and get, get to work as quickly as possible. We have a matching grant program that provides a little bit more support for the first four months, but four months. Um, that's intensive time um, with staff and families to get them moving as quickly as possible. That doesn't mean we stop at the end of four months, but it certainly means the funding that helps them stops at that point. So um, it's a difficult road, but it's one definitely worth walking because when you see the other side, when you go to the restaurants and when you go to the gardens and you go to the businesses and you find the little children who otherwise may not have life at all, when you see the differences in, that it makes in the lives of families and children, it's definitely something worthwhile. Um, it's tough work, but it's, if, if the families that come have survived what they survive, the work that we put in, um, their time has far outweighed what we have. You know, I have learned far more from the refugees that I've worked with than they will ever learn from me. Um, you know, I think it's ironic that we teach them financial literacy and yet they know how to save in a way that sometimes we haven't even thought of in the last 20 years. They come with skills. They're, they're families. They're just families who have been uprooted from one place and living in another. Um, they know how to be parents. We just have to teach them about the rules in the United States. They know how to make a living. We just need to teach them the rules here. So it's, it's really a lot of education that goes into that. Well, it's an astounding self-sustaining program that is additive to this community. It is certainly not a program that extracts resources uh, uh, from, the, from the community. Instead, 250 homes, how many cars? Uh, about 350 cars 350 purchased. cars. The most expensive commodities that we ever buy in our lives are cars and homes. And so as an indicator of, of success, um, given the, the very, very modest budget that this organization runs on and the various contributions that these people have given us, mm -hmm. it is just a wonderful example of how America uh, can help others and, and help ourselves simultaneously, refreshing our, our innovation and refreshing our values uh, at the same time. Great. Donna, thank you so much for your insights and thank, thank you, you for, for sharing with us. Thank you very much.